Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 45, Apollo 14, Part 2, A Long Way. Last time, we covered NASA's return to flight after Apollo 13, the goals of Apollo 14, and the somewhat rocky trip out to the moon. While nothing had approached Apollo 13 levels of concern, the hardware aboard Kitty Hawk and Antari seemed to be doing its best to make this next moon landing a challenge. Most serious was an unusually difficult transposition and docking shortly after launch, and then a floating ball of solder sending spurious abort signals to the LEM guidance computer. We left off with Mission Commander Alan Shepard and Lunar Module Pilot Ed Mitchell descending to the surface in their Lunar Module, dubbed Antares. They had just executed a tricky and time-sensitive series of computer commands to prevent the bad abort signals from ending the mission early, and were settling in for the rest of power descent and landing. Hopefully with the somewhat hair-raising computer hacks out of the way, they could expect a nice smooth landing. But of course, no such luck. Somewhere between 40,000 feet and 30,000 feet above the moon, Ed Mitchell began to grow concerned. The landing radar had not yet locked onto the lunar surface. Technically, it wasn't required to until 30,000 feet, but previous missions had seen this all-important event occur by 40,000 feet. They sailed through 30,000 feet and still had no landing radar lock-on. If the radar did not kick in by 10,000 feet, the mission rules called for a mandatory abort. Game over. Given that this device seems to be of pretty critical importance, let's take a quick moment to discuss its role in the mission. Some of you may be wondering why the landing radar is so crucial, or maybe even necessary. After all, Apollo 14 got all the way to the moon without radar, right? Why would it need it in the last few feet? The landing radar was basically a supplement to the onboard inertial measurement unit, which is what's used for most of the flight. An inertial measurement unit, or IMU, is a device that carefully monitors its own change in velocity, allowing it to reconstruct its position. To appreciate how difficult of a task this is, imagine you are blindfolded and then driven down a long and windy road. By keeping track of the left and right banks and how long you drove between them, you might be able to get a sense of where you were, but chances are you'd be way off base after only a turn or two. Even with sophisticated equipment, this buildup of error is still a problem. An IMU isn't going to be perfect, and that little bit of error that it picks up is just going to build and build and build. Plus, for those of you with a math background out there, you'll realize that what an IMU is actually doing is integrating in order to arrive at position, and you're going to end up with that pesky plus C constant, which is an inevitable source of error. In space, this actually isn't a huge problem. The IMU used on Apollo was pretty impressive and remained accurate for long stretches at a time, but it also received regular updates from the ground and from onboard navigation sightings. And most importantly, in space there's not much to hit. As long as you're not off by hundreds of miles, you're probably going to be fine. Landing on the moon is different. Suddenly an error of even a few dozen feet could really be catastrophic. To solve this problem, the lunar module was equipped with a radar unit. Radar is a device that emits radio waves and listens for them to bounce back. By measuring how long it took for the wave to return, it's able to know how far away the wave-bouncing object is. It can also tell how fast that object is approaching, or how fast you're approaching the object. As the LEM approaches the surface, the landing radar begins receiving waves that is bouncing off the surface. It's locked on. The computer then takes this information and feeds it into the data it already had from the IMU. The difference between the height the computer thought they were above the surface and the height the radar says they actually are is called the delta H. The initial delta H could be quite large, even a couple thousand feet, but by using the radar to update its numbers, the delta H would quickly approach zero and the LEM would know where it was. This especially came into play in the final moments of landing, where visibility was often poor. By telling the crew their altitude and vertical descent rate, a safe landing could still be performed while enveloped in a giant dust cloud. So yeah, landing radar. Pretty important. Can't land without it. Or can you? Alan Shepard later said that he had intended to continue with the landing whether or not the radar kicked in. He had just come too far. I guess he figured that either it would eventually kick in, or he'd just eyeball it all the way in. In reality, there would be no way to pull this feat off. The difference between the IMU and the actual position was just too great. 
a pilot as good as Shepard would have to eventually admit defeat and abort, rather than continue on to a guaranteed crash. Thankfully for Shepard, and everyone involved really, the fix turned out to be simple. A classic. Cycle the circuit breaker. In other words, turn it off and on again. It turns out that the radar actually was working the whole time, sort of. The details are way in the weeds, but thanks to a specific bit of noisy data coming at a specific time, the radar had dropped into low-scale mode. This mode is only used when very close to the surface, so it just couldn't see it from 30,000 feet up. Maybe Shepard was right and it would have kicked in eventually anyway. But we'll never know, because with about 18,000 feet to go, the radar was working. Two minutes after fixing the landing radar, Antares pitched forward and the crew had their first view of the landing site. They were dead on perfect. And for the first time, an Apollo crew was actually able to use their landing point designator in the window. On 11 and 12, there had been more fuel sloshing than expected, so the entire vehicle sort of swayed back and forth. This didn't really impact the landing, but it meant that the view outside the window was constantly changing a little bit. On Apollo 14, some additional baffles had been installed in the fuel tanks to prevent this sloshing. This was pretty tricky to do since they didn't want to crack the tanks open, so they somehow installed them through a 2-inch opening on the bottom, like a ship in a bottle. Engineers are amazing. With 300 feet remaining, Shepard took over manual control of Antares' attitude, entering Program 66. Before long, the crew were noticing dust out the windows, but nothing as crippling as that experience on Apollo 12. Two minutes after taking manual control, the contact probe touched, the blue lunar contact light illuminated, the engine was shut down, and Antares gently settled into the dust of Fra Mauro. First on the agenda after getting through the usual post-landing rush of activities was preparing for EVA-1. Like Apollo 12, two EVAs were scheduled, but a little more time had been squeezed out of the spacesuit systems, so they'd be shooting for more like four and a half hours each. 113 hours and 47 minutes after leaving Florida behind in a blaze of rocket exhaust, Alan Shepard began to climb out onto the lunar module porch. Just a few months shy of the 10-year anniversary of his and America's first flight in space, Shepard set foot on the lunar surface. His first words were, Al is on the surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. Not long after that, Mitchell hopped down the ladder to join him. Mitchell's first words on the surface are hardly a quote for the ages. He said he's releasing it now, in reference to some equipment that Shepard was unloading. EVA-1 was dominated by the now-familiar ALSEP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. This bundle of various experiments would continue to beam valuable data down to scientists on Earth long after the astronauts had gone. Most of these experiments were repeats of stuff we've already covered, including another passive seismometer. But one experiment in particular really caught my eye. The active seismic experiment is one of these classic instances of NASA having a super boring name for a super cool thing. What this thing was, and I can't believe I've never heard of this before, was a device for launching explosive grenades on the moon. I kid you not. After the astronauts had safely gone home and gotten the heck away from this thing, it would fire four rocket-propelled explosive devices at varying distances, with one going over a mile. The vibrations caused by raining bombs down on the moon would be picked up by the instruments in the ASE and transmitted back to Earth where geologists could study them. 1971, the year we bombed the moon. Four hours and 47 minutes after it began, EVA-1 ended with both men crawling back into the LEM. They pulled off their gear and tried to get some sleep during their rest period. They had a big day awaiting them when they woke up. After sleeping for about six hours, the crew woke up and began preparations for EVA-2. The objective for this EVA was a little different. The goal was to make their way over to the rim of the nearby Cone Crater, about 1,100 meters to the east, over two-thirds of a mile. By taking samples on the rim of the crater, as well as on the way there and back, they hoped to learn more about how this region of the moon was formed. A crater can be used as a sort of natural excavation site. When the crater is formed, it tears deep into the surface, exposing layers that would require extensive digging otherwise. It also throws all the material out in a predictable pattern. 
By taking samples around the crater, they could effectively get samples at varying depths. And it was a lot easier to do this than trying to dig a few hundred feet into the surface. To help them bring all their equipment out there and back, the astronauts had a new piece of equipment, the Modular Equipment Transporter, or as the astronauts called it, the Lunar Rickshaw. This was actually the piece of equipment that Mitchell was talking about Shepard unpacking during his first words on the surface. The MET was basically just a little wheeled cart that made it easier for the astronauts to do their job. Rather than carrying all of their equipment by hand or from a strap, they could just wheel it around. And there was a lot of gear to worry about. Not just tools, but samples, cameras, film, sensors, and, well, something special I'll get to in a little bit. The two astronauts got their lunar rickshaw and started off on what would prove to be the longest on-foot hike of the Apollo program. Their trek began smoothly enough. Several times they stopped to take rock samples or readings from a magnetometer. The slightly uphill slant began to be reflected in their heart rates, as noted by the flight surgeon, but nothing crazy. Pretty soon, though, a funny thing began to happen. It turns out that it's actually pretty tough to navigate on the moon. Lots of subtle cues that the human mind has evolved to look for when evaluating its own vision just don't exist. Since there's no air, there's no atmospheric haze. You might not realize it, but a lot of your depth information comes from your brain assuming that more distant objects become more and more faded. On the moon, just about everything in your field of vision is a bunch of gray planes and gray rocks, and combined with the lack of atmosphere, it becomes difficult to tell if something is a small rock near you or a big rock far away. And lastly, the gently undulating features of the landscape, combined with the closer horizon, means that the stuff you're expecting to see may be hidden from view. The outcome of all this was that the Apollo 14 crew wasn't exactly lost, but they also couldn't quite locate the rim of the crater. Looking at satellite photos, it seems difficult to believe, but it's not like there's a sharp line in the dust that says, Crater starts here. What's obvious from miles above isn't so obvious when you're walking around in it trying to figure out which way is which. Several times, the crew would think that the crater rim was just a little bit further, only to get there and see what appeared to actually be the real crater rim just a little, little bit further. Eventually, there was nothing to do but call it. While Shepard and Mitchell weren't totally sure where they were, they had to be at least close. They took their samples and turned around for the long walk back to Antares, dragging the MET behind them. It turns out they were right. They were close. Later scrutiny by analysts on the ground showed that they were actually about 100 feet from their target area. In the challenging landscape, they had shifted slightly south, so if the crater were a clock, instead of arriving at 9 o'clock, they sort of brushed up against 6 o'clock on the southern edge of the crater, not quite reaching the rim. Oh well, lesson learned, I guess. When the crew arrived back at Antares, they had a little extra time that had been reserved to deal with any delays. Taking advantage of these few extra moments, Shepard turned to the TV camera and radioed down, Houston, while you're looking that up, you might recognize what I have in my hand as the handle for the contingency sample return. It just so happens to have a genuine six iron at the bottom of it. In my left hand, I have a little white pellet that's familiar to millions of Americans. I'll drop it down. Unfortunately, the suit is so stiff I can't do this with two hands, but I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. America's first spaceman had used his small personal items bag to smuggle a golf club head and a couple of golf balls. He attached the club head to the end of his contingency sample return tool, dropped a ball down, and took a swing at it. In the cumbersome suit, his first attempt didn't go so great, as noted by Mitchell who commented, You got more dirt than ball that time, and Capcom Fred Hayes watching on TV who said, That looks like a slice to me, Al. But his later attempt succeeded, sending the ball flying off into the distance, with Shepard calling after it, miles and miles and miles. And with that, it was back to work. The entire episode just took barely over a minute. And while most people probably wouldn't be able to place which mission it happened on, I'd be willing to bet that the short game of golf was likely the most famous part about Apollo 14. Samples collected, photographs taken, and golf balls hit, Shepard and Mitchell piled back into Antares for the trip home. Ascent and Rendezvous was a little quicker than usual, since for the first time an M equals 1 Rendezvous was attempted. 
allowing Antares to arrive in the vicinity of Kitty Hawk after only one revolution around the moon. Unlike earlier in the mission, docking presented no problems, but just to be safe, the crew would bring the docking probe back home with them for inspection. On the trip home, a number of material science experiments were performed, with the hopes of paving the way for orbiting laboratories and processing plants. They also tested how the CSM systems would handle depressurization, since there were some big plans for the return leg of upcoming missions. Nine days, one minute, and 58 seconds after departing Earth, Kitty Hawk and its three occupants splashed down in the ocean, safe and sound. Apollo 14 was successfully concluded. If you ever find yourself at the Kennedy Space Center, you can see Kitty Hawk for yourself on display at the Saturn V Center. And while I can't confirm anything, and certainly wouldn't condone it today, it is possible that a 14-year-old version of myself thought it would be a good idea to jam his hand through a gap in the protective plastic case and touch the heat shield of that command module. It might also be possible that there exists a photo of heat shield soot on his fingers, but who knows for sure. With Apollo 14 behind us, it's time once again to bid farewell to one of the Mercury 7. Alan Shepard had a fascinating spaceflight career, spanning 15 years. When selected as part of the Mercury 7 in 1959, he quickly stood out from the pack and was put on the shortlist for first flight, before finally securing that role for himself. His achievement aboard Freedom 7 was often overshadowed by the flight of Yuri Gagarin just a few weeks earlier, and by John Glenn's orbital flight aboard Friendship 7 a few months later. But there is no taking away what he accomplished. He was the first American in space. And as I stressed many episodes back, arguably flew the first true piloted spaceflight. Unlike Gagarin, he exercised manual control over his vehicle and remained with the spacecraft all the way down through splashdown. You know, like a pilot. His subsequent battle with Manier's disease, experimental surgery, and victorious return to flight status is like something out of a Hollywood screenplay, and he was the only one of the Mercury 7 to walk on the moon. After his flight, he remained with NASA for a few years before retiring in 1974. After that, he did what seems to be the usual post-astronaut career and joined the board of a number of companies. Using the same smarts and focus that got him to Fra Mauro, along with more than a little name recognition, he made him and his family wealthy. He still occasionally worked with his fellow astronauts, providing scholarships and writing books. And speaking of books, if you want to know more about Alan Shepard, I can't recommend enough reading Light This Candle by Neil Thompson. I read this book years ago, and it was one of the first things that really kindled my interest in the pre-Apollo space program. In 1996, Shepard was diagnosed with leukemia and passed away two years later on July 21st, 1998. He was 74 years old and spent nine days and 57 minutes in space. Next time, in the words of Alan Shepard, we remain A-OK -okay, full go. Apollo 14 turned out to be the last of the H missions, which focused on proving techniques for more advanced missions to come. Well, those missions have come. NASA decided that I missions were too confusing in print, so we're going right to the first J mission, Apollo 15. With more focus on science than ever before, a geologist trained crew was headed to the moon. And yeah, playing golf on the moon is pretty cool, but you know what's really cool? Driving a car on the moon. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>